Good afternoon to our viewers in Switzerland and good morning to all those connecting to this webinar from overseas. It is a great pleasure to welcome you in the name of LATCAM to our first online event this year, which is supported by our patron UBS and focuses on Latin America's economic and financial markets outlook. If I ask any of you today what you consider are currently the biggest reasons for concern for Latin America, for your country or sector, I expect to get a variety of answers within the full range from those with an immediate to those with a long-term impact. And as if inflation, supply shortages, energy price increase, climate change, migration, and the rise of informality were not enough, to name just a few, we are now all witnessing this new and unexpected war, which has the potential to introduce a paradigm shift in how the world will connect and function in the future. What can Latin American markets expect in 2022? Which new repercussions must be considered? And where do we see opportunities emerge in this evolved context? To put many of these aspects in perspective and hopefully provide some positive momentum too, we have invited back an expert, a friend in fact, who some of you will remember from his vivid and powerful presentation during our Latin America Day 2021. He is the Chief Investment Officer, Emerging Markets Americas, at UBS's Global Wealth Management in New York. I'm grateful that he immediately accepted my invitation to be with us once again for this hour. A warm welcome back, Alejo Cervonco. I'm equally delighted that our board member from UBS, Matthias Musch, is also with us today and will address an introductory message to you in a moment. A warm welcome, Matthias, and great to see you again. This webinar is recorded and will be at everybody's disposal on our website and on our YouTube channel, LATCAM Switzerland, as of tomorrow. After Alejo's presentation, we will open the virtual floor for your questions. As always, please write them in the Q&A area, and I will take them by order. You can also do this anonymously. Now, I'm pleased to hand over to you, Matthias. Thank you, Tatiana, and thank you all for your time. Uh, my name is Matthias Musch, and I'm based here in Switzerland and have the privilege to head the Latin American business of UBS in, in Europe. Um, what is UBS in Latin America? First of all, and this is pure figures, uh, we're looking now at 65 years of continued onshore presence in Latin America. We currently have uh, more than 550 uh, advisors covering more than uh, 35,000 clients. We are present in uh, six different Latin American countries, which are supported by uh, booking centers in the US, Switzerland, UK, and, uh, and Germany. And I, I can say, and uh, I, I, I ask you that, do, do not take this arrogance that we have seen in UBS the last two years in our business and, and unparalleled growth. I think this growth is also driven by some uh, important new local partnerships, as for example, Banco de Brasil and Consenso in Brazil, and the more recently Inverlink in uh, Colombia. So I think uh, what has very well worked for our clients and for us is that we combine our global uh, outreach with our strong local with our strong local presence, yeah, which I think nowadays is, is of very big, uh, big importance. What is a bit our purpose? Our purpose is, is really that we are not only, let's say, the trusted advisor to our clients, but that we also take advantage of our size and of our global outreach uh, to connect people and to connect ideas for a, for a better world. Um, and, um, and that also brings me to my last point, uh, a better world. Um, I think, uh, well, we are bankers, we talk a lot about figures and business plans and so forth and so on. But uh, for us at UBS, uh, Latin America is not only a business. Uh, for us, it's, uh, I would say it's a, it's a continent, first of all, with a long and fascinating history and also with an incredible amount of talent and opportunities. But unfortunately, as we all know, also still with a lot of economic, political and social challenges. And that's why uh, uh, it's for me very important, first of all, that we do not only support Latin America um, uh, through our uh, Optimus foundations that supports several projects uh, locally in Latin America, but also and that makes me particularly proud that many of my colleagues 
uh, take a lot of their personal time uh, to support uh, projects in Latin America or to even launch their own projects. Um, because to us at UBS, it's, it's very clear uh, and it's paramount that uh, um, our, the growth of our business goes hand in hand with the growth in Latin America. Um, we, we strongly believe in Latin America. We are there for the long run. We want to invest in the region and we want to not only again see it as a business, but also um, uh, support the ongoing growth of, of this fantastic uh, on this fantastic continent. And with that, I will um, hand over to my colleague Alejo. Uh, I know that the title says it's the economic outlook for Latin America, but uh, as we all know, uh, unfortunately, the the focus today is uh, at uh, what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, it, um, I have to say personally, and I think I'm not alone here. Uh, I, I was I was shocked uh, when I heard the news last last week. I still remember very well in '89, uh, and many of you as well. I think uh, when the Berlin Wall com came down, uh, the enthusiasm, uh, and that we were euphoric yeah, and thinking, well, this is not only the beginning of the reunification of Germany, but this is going to be the new European house. Yeah, this will bring us closer together. And actually, that happened through many years, and it was a big illusion. And uh, uh, and it seems that this illusion last uh, Thursday died, yeah? uh, which is very difficult and hard to digest, but it's it, unfortunately it's it's the reality of today. Yeah? Um, and it's a bit, uh, to, to be very uh, blunt, it's a bit difficult to, to stay focused on business in these times. Yeah? But at the end of the day, it's the job that we are, that's our job and we want to do it well. And I think, and this is something we're going to hear now from Alejo, obviously uh, Ukraine and Russia and the sanctions uh, have, uh, have uh, definitely also some negative impacts on Latin America. Again, it's a globalized world, but, and it might sound sad, but it also might uh, um, represent some, some opportunities. Yeah, and uh, we are here for the long run and we, it's, our it's our business and our, our purpose to also sh show you these opportunities. So I'm very curious as I'm sure you are as well to hear from Alejo, um, what is our view on Latin America? What is our view on what's going to come in the, in the future? And then I hope that we have a very vibrant uh, discussion and get many questions uh, and uh, hear some interesting thoughts from everyone. So thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you for trusting in UBS. And with that, I hand over to you, Alejo. Matias, thank you for the introduction. Tatiana, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, first of all, I want to be mindful. I'm going to speak quite pragmatically about economies, about asset prices, but the reality is we're facing a very severe humanitarian crisis as we speak. Uh, my thoughts are we're, with all those uh, thousands of families that have been displaced, uh, all those folks that do not know if they're gonna make it past this conflict. And, and therefore it is important to maybe open up with those, with those comments. Uh, UBS has set up a humanitarian relief fund through the Optimus Foundation. And so to those in the call interested in, in, in participating, feel free to reach out to us. UBS is matching, uh, I believe, 100% of every, every donation um, in order to at least add our two cents in, in this uh, unfortunate set of circumstances. Um, going directly to, to the presentation, I think there's no sugarcoating. Uh, the risk case scenario of full invasion of uh, Ukraine has materialized. And once again, quite pragmatically, um, for global investors, for Latin America, whatever happens per se in Russia or whatever happens per se in Ukraine is not that relevant. When you think about the size of the Russian economy as a, a percentage of the global economy, we are talking about 1.75%. When you look at the size of the Ukrainian economy as a percentage of the global economy, 20 basis points, 0.2%. Uh, and so it's not all that relevant, except for the main contagion channel of this crisis, which is the flow and the pricing of commodities. I'm not only talking about energy commodities, uh, gas, oil, coal, but quite relevant for Latin America, agricultural commodities, thinking about, um, of course, wheat, corn, among, among others. And so we're standing here today 
the US, Europe, and other allies such as Japan, Korea have put out a set of sanctions that are attempting to maximize influence on Russia without backfiring in terms of flow and pricing of commodities. They've gone out of their way to try to prevent this flow and pricing to be uh, from being impacted. We are seeing nonetheless some spillover. Uh, the jury is still out on whether, let's call it broadly speaking, the West will be successful in preventing the flow of um, uh, oil, gas, wheat, corn from being negatively uh, impacted. Uh, but we think they're going to continue to try their best to prevent this from happening because this will have this would have an impact on global economic activity. This would have an impact on uh, global inflation, and therefore it is in the best interest of once again, broadly speaking, the West from preventing this from from happening. Um, look, if we transition directly into the impact of this on, on Latin America, and you allowed me to share a few slides with you. Um, here we go. The global environment is uh, arguably mixed for our region. There are some good news and there are some bad news. On net, I think we need to recognize that the world is looking more challenging and more dangerous than it looked last year for our region by and large. Starting with some silver lining or areas of, of, of good news, uh, commodity prices, uh, of course, without a doubt. When you look at the evolution of the price of oil, wheat, soy, corn, et cetera, we are witnessing pricing conditions that we haven't seen almost in history in some commodities and with some others reaching uh, uh, recent highs, if not challenging all time highs. Uh, in this regard, as Matthias highlighted, what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, as sad as it is, could be the source of some opportunities for Latin America. Interestingly, we're seeing uh, some markets such as the Brazilian markets being interpreted uh, by at least a group of investors as a quasi safe haven in the face of uncertainty. Who would have thought just a few months ago that Brazilian equities would be up double digits year to date in dollar terms, that the Brazilian real would appreciate strongly so far this year in a pretty challenging year for Brazil overall with slowing growth, high inflation, a central bank that is hiking interest rates quite aggressively, and of course, uh, pivotal elections in, in Brazil. Nonetheless, benefiting from a challenging global environment, investors are looking for where to hide and they are finding some interesting places in Latin America in that regard. Now, here's the not as good news. As we all know, inflation is high and still rising in uh, the majority of the world. In particular, we're seeing a pretty drastic removal of monetary accommodation in the, in, in, in the United States, in all of Latin America, and in much of the emerging world. The one exception to this trend, and we can talk about this later, is China. While the rest of the world is hiking interest rates and removing liquidity from the system, China is cutting interest rate and injecting liquidity to the system. Uh, giving the Chinese markets some interesting properties in 2022. But going back to the bigger picture, what we're seeing for Latin America is that the availability of global capital is not going to be as generous as it used to be. This chart over here shows you market expectations of how the Federal Reserve may act in coming months. As we speak, and this is changing by the hour, the US Fed is expected to start hiking interest rates this month in just a couple of weeks time and to continue doing so for the foreseeable future. In the next 12 months alone, the most likely outcome according to market pricing is for the Fed fund interest rate to uh, be trading at a level of 1.5% from zero 
to 1.5%, we're talking about approximately six interest rate increases of 25 basis points each. Of course, uh, this is not ideal for Latin American sovereigns. This is not ideal for Latin American corporates. This means that they will have to compete in terms of attractive, attracting funding with, let's call it a risk-free rate of very short-term US treasury bonds at one and a half percent. So investors will have to think about it twice before allocating capital to the rest of the world, in particular, Latin America. Um, now, this environment notwithstanding, I think we need to recognize that, uh, and this is something that I had shared with you the last time we spoke, Latin America was really badly hit by COVID initially, a region that is home to roughly eight and a half percent of the global population, um, was unfortunately uh, subject to over 30% of global COVID related deaths, an over representation of uh, the pain in, in a global context, very, very significant. That said, over time and on the back of a by and large lack of vaccine hesitancy, we have seen Latin America come to the top of the league in terms of vaccine penetration. And what we're seeing today is quite remarkable. Look at this chart over here, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, having deeper penetration of vaccines than much of the developed world. And this is something that if we project moving forward will most likely continue to be the case. This has allowed the Latin America economic recovery to be quite resilient to the latest wave of Omicron. As you can see in this slide, mobility indices from um, taken from, from Google in terms of you know, how much people are moving around uh, workplaces and other, and other areas relative to benchmarks. You can see that uh, the Omicron hit was brief and uh, relatively modest uh, in terms of impact on mobility. And today, most large economies in Latin America are operating as if nothing happened. So this is clearly a tailwind, something that I think will uh, support the economic recovery in the region moving, moving forward. So this is where we stand in terms of economic growth expectations. Uh, as I've shared with you in the past, pre-pandemic, the region uh, was exhibiting very poor, mediocre growth dynamics. Average GDP growth on a yearly basis in the five years before the pandemic was zero for Latin America. The pandemic hit quite badly. We saw one of the largest contractions in economic activity globally for Latin America vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the US, the Eurozone, and other emerging markets. The recovery was quite uh, drastic as well in 2021. And we find we ourselves in 2022 converging back to what we think are levels of economic activity that are more trend-like, right? Averaging something around uh, one and a half to 2%. Um, in a way, the easy phase of the recovery is behind us. It will continue, um, but we need to recognize that there are a number of fragilities behind uh, when you look under, under the hood. And I think these fragilities are illustrated by this uh, main economic activity indicators or gauges of the health of the Latin America economy that you can see in this, in this slide. On the top right, there's the issue of inflation. Uh, price pressures are prevalent in Latin America and I think are unlikely to have peaked. I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a minute. Uh, bottom left, current account position. What you can see is that the region overall, more some countries uh, more so than, than others, is exhibiting a current account deficit. This means that uh, at the macroeconomic level, a country is living beyond its means. Every month, every quarter, capital needs to come in from abroad to finance this living beyond uh, your means. 
in an environment in which global capital is becoming more scarce, in an environment in which we'll go from policy rates at zero in the United States to something closer to one and a half percent in 12 months time, financing this situation will become more difficult. Uh, of course, once again, this is not a blanket statement necessarily for every single Latin American economy, but look at those economies that have current account deficits, they're more vulnerable to uh, an environment of less abundant, less generous global liquidity. Bottom right, you can see budget balance. There's almost no Latin American economy that has a government that is living within its means. This was a serious issue before the pandemic and has been exacerbated by, by the pandemic. Uh, there are widespread fiscal deficits in the region. And quite interestingly, there is very to extremely limited desire to address this problem at hand. There's a lot of tension between the ability of governments to continue to spend and the expectations and um, uh, requests of the populations for improved, improved goods, goods and services from the fiscal side. So this uh, topic of debt sustainability will continue to come back to hunt us in Latin America in, in coming years, uh, and uh, it's unlikely to, to go away. Allow me to double click on, on the inflation topic because it has second order effects on, on economic activity overall. What you can see in this chart is that in every single major Latin American economy, inflation is standing well above the tolerance bands from the central bank. Uh, tolerance bands are illustrated in dotted red lines. Inflation is uh, the black line. And um, interestingly, while the probability of inflationary dynamics having peaked was growing as of two to three weeks time with the Russia invasion of Ukraine, with um, the spike in, in energy prices. Good news overall for many Latin American economies, but when it comes to inflation, this is going to make inflationary dynamics more challenging. This is going to make the job of central banks in Latin America more difficult. In particular, this is what uh, policy rates in the region are looking like. Every single major Latin American economy is hiking domestic interest rates. Quite interestingly, they've done this ahead of the Fed. These hiking cycles in Latin America have started uh, early in 2021. And as you can see in the graph, most central banks have accumulated hikes well in advance of the first move by the Fed uh, in, in, in uh, March. This has protected uh, the value of currencies in, in Latin America. This helps explain the resilience of Latin American currencies so far this year in the face of adversity. Uh, and this is something that I think will continue to be the case because you've got an expectation that central banks from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, even Argentina have hiked and will continue to hike interest rates. While this is relatively good news for the currency, while this is relatively good news for overall financial stability, this will pour cold water on the recovery and will in a way make it a, a bit more challenging in terms of uh, breadth and depth. Let me just highlight the other elephant in the room of Latin America, which has to do with the electoral super cycle. We've had countless and very important elections in Latin America since 2021. This process will continue in 2022. Here you can see a summary of the most relevant uh, signposts in terms of uh, what's expected politically from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. Uh, Brazil, of course, will elect um, president, which is an incredibly important choice to determine uh, the future of reforms, the future of uh, uh, fiscal responsibility in, in a country that continues to have severe debt challenges. So all eyes will be uh, on, on this, what today seems to be a very binary choice between 
to, to extremes that is unlikely to change, right? It, you know, our view has to do with uh, uh, the probability of a, of a third, third uh, a, middle, a middle choice being extremely, extremely limited in, in this context. We've got Chile where uh, voters will have to approve whatever comes out of the Constitutional Assembly. Uh, things are getting underway in terms of the write-up of this new constitution and the jury is still out on what exactly it would look like and whether voters will endorse uh, this, this final text. Colombia has one of the most important years in its history from a political standpoint. Uh, everything will be voted for in Colombia. 13 March is arguably the most relevant day of the year for the country where you have presidential primaries that will define exactly what the universe of presidential candidates will be. And you will have um, a, a renewal of, of Congress uh, overall. Therefore, we'll be better able to understand if the incoming administration will have checks and balances or, or not, and to what extent, right? Uh, of course, as, as we all know, there is deep discontent in, in Latin America, deep uh, interest and request for, for political change. I don't view what's going on as a wholesale shift to the left. This is a wholesale shift towards, I don't want whatever is there, I want something else, right? And therefore we need to take the uh, uh, candidacy of Petro very seriously. Uh, there's still many months to the 29th month, the 29th May presidential first round election in Colombia. However, the front runner Petro I think has, has, has quite decent chance of, of, of making it to, to, to the presidency. It will all depend on who exactly is competing with him 13 March once again, uh, the, the day to watch. And finally, uh, Mexico, there's a recall referendum to get Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador will give voters the possibility to have an opinion on how he stands so far. I, I think this is more likely than not going to be a non-event, given that he's got the popular support. And I'd argue this is the least important or impactful uh, political event of the year within, within uh, the major Latin American economies. Let me um, highlight a, a number of, of bright spots before uh, I go through some additional signposts in Latin America that might be, be of interest on a country by country level. Look, um, I share with you that the external backdrop is more challenging, particularly when it comes to financing countries, financing corporates from abroad. Uh, the silver lining here is that the investor focus on ESG continues to grow. Uh, the interest by investors, for instance, on green, social, and sustainable bonds seems to be sh anything short of insatiable at this point. And Latin America has an opportunity to continue to build frameworks in this area and to do a serious job at uh, attracting capital interested in this area of finance. Uh, we have seen record number of issuance in terms of green social and sustainable bonds in Latin America in 2021. We've had a healthy start of 2022. Um, I do believe that if countries and corporates use this tool right, it can help mitigate any shortage of capital that you might be seeing more broadly in, in the global economy. The second bright spot that I wanted to highlight in, in Latin America that I think can have large microeconomic impact, but relatively modest macroeconomic impact has to do with tech innovation, right? Uh, there are uh, very thirsty, very capable entrepreneurs in the region. You've seen capital becoming available for innovative ideas when it comes to uh, the intersection of technology and finance, when it comes to the intersection of uh, technology and health or technology and food, we've seen great success stories in Latin America. And I think this is a trend that will continue moving forward. Uh, this is very good for uh, 
the reputation of the region. This is very good for uh, those directly impacted. I have my doubts that this will have macroeconomic impacts. I have my doubts that this will allow, for instance, potential GDP in the region to increase drastically from here. But nonetheless, uh, something good and something positive to highlight out of, out of Latin America. Um, finally, a few words on specific economies and what to, what to watch out for. Argentina, everything is focused on the IMF negotiations. Uh, I think I've been saying this for some time. It is more likely than not that an agreement will be reached. We are almost there. It is a low quality agreement and I think it's a low credibility agreement. This is simply a kick the can down the road situation. The Argentine administration is betting that something will save the day like higher commodity prices down the road. The IMF is, is, is betting that something will save the day, some, uh, something along the lines of a regime change in 2023. So they agreed to disagree, push this problem forward and let's talk in a few quarters. We talk, we've talked about Brazil, elections, elections, elections in, in 2022. That is going to be the name of the game. Chile, new administration coming in in just, in just a few days time, 11 March. Uh, Boric has moderated his uh, initial stance, has surrounded himself by uh, decent human capital, let's call it, when it comes to key posts in the economics and finance field. Let's see whether this trend continues. I think the jury is, is still out. My view is that the Chile that expects us, uh, that we should expect to see moving forward is very different from the Chile that we've become accustomed to over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, Colombia, we've talked about the elections as well and the, the threat from, from, from the left. Important to see whether we're gonna be facing a, a moderate Petro or a more extreme Petro. In Mexico, the RICO referendum, I think, will be a non-event. However, the biggest known unknown is the proposed constitutional reform on the electricity sector. Uh, this uh, is bad from an ESG per perspective. This is bad from a private sector visibility perspective. This is bad from a US-Mexico relationship standpoint. So uh, our view is that this is more likely than not, not going to happen. However, a watered down version, an altered version could, could take place. And, and look, I mean, in, in Peru, uh, the political situation is uh, soap opera-ish. Every day there's a new cabinet. Uh, the staying power of Castillo is being put in question. Uh, of course, none of this helps visibility for, for private companies and, and supports growth in, in the medium term. Uh, there's no reason to believe that we'll find a stable equilibrium in, in the near future, unfortunately. Good. Uh, I want to try to make this not just a monologue, so I'll pass over the word, the microphone to Tatiana. Thank you so much for, for watching, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Alejo. I don't have any questions yet in the Q&A, so I'm just going to go with my own, if I may. Um, nothing with what you said so far, but last year, the president of El Salvador introduced Bitcoin as a legal tender. What is your take on cryptocurrencies? Do you see a future for them in a broader sense? And um, for the moment, I haven't seen UBS introducing cryptocurrencies as part of its more risk-friendly portfolio investments. Um, is this uh, going to change anytime soon? Tatiana always has the easy questions for me. Thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, they are welcome. Look, by and large, um, we make a distinction between the technology behind cryptocurrencies and the application of the technology, which are cryptocurrencies per se. Uh, the blockchain innovation as a technology that allows to create trust among a group of individuals that don't know each other without the need for an intermediate uh, seems to be quite interesting 
and long lasting. So uh, we think that allocating capital and maybe trying to get exposure to the economic and financial impact from the blockchain is something that we encourage. Uh, within the universe of applications from the blockchain technology, you have got currencies, right? Cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin being one of them, but as by now there are dozens, if not hundreds uh, of, of options, right? Um, we are actively analyzing the merits of this assets in a broader investment portfolio. So far, they haven't shown the necessary properties in terms of return and risk and correlation with other assets for us to include them actively in, 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 our, in our portfolios. Uh, my uh, recommendation is that there's nothing wrong with being engaged with this asset, but I think uh, it's important to remember that there's a lot that we do not know. And in a way, I would take it as an asset with a somewhat binary outcome. Things can go very well or things can go extremely bad. And so this uh, should inform how much exposure you take in your overall portfolio. Let me say a few words about El Salvador. Um, look, I think uh, by and large, the world is better off by a country in the world trying new things out. Uh, and therefore, could El Salvador be the guinea pig in terms of adoption of you know, this, this technology in this application? So I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing. What uh, I would question, however, is the way in, it, in which it was done. Uh, could this be interpreted more as a whim by one person and an implementation in a haphazard manner? While I think the world would have been better served by a, the design and development of a systematic plan and its implementation, right? And so um, that's what I that's what I, I'd say for now. Thank you. So now I have a couple of questions here from Almedo Alfaro. Thank you very much. Do you have any views on Panama that you can provide? Um, look, Panama is a relatively well-managed economy uh, when you compare it to the larger Latin American economies. Uh, in, in addition, policy visibility is, I think, on average, a bit, a bit higher. Uh, and it is a country that is highly leveraged to the global economic recovery. Right, and, and therefore our central scenario today is that the world will continue to grow at above trend levels in 2022. And therefore this is something that should be positive for Panama. The one thing that we all need to recognize is that the war in, 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 the, in, in the Russian war in Ukraine through the commodities channel is threatening this recovery. And we'll need to see how long oil prices, for instance, stay this high. We've crossed the level of the $110 per barrel today. If this levels were to persistently continue for, for an extended period of time, this will pour core water on the recovery and therefore uh, on, on Panama as a leverage play to, to, to the global economy. Um, I hope that that helps. Then we have an anonymous viewer who asks, can you please elaborate on your Chile reflection that we will see a very different Chile to the Chile we saw in the last 10 to 20 years? Absolutely. Um, so, so look, uh, I think the, the Chile of the last two decades was characterized by low politics and politics volatility in relative terms by uh, very low levels of government intervention in the economy in relative terms, by uh, uh, very high levels of fiscal responsibility, that is um, 
deficits and debts at the government level being uh, extremely well managed, right? When it comes to not only Latin America, but the emerging world. Uh, I think we need to be prepared for persistently higher levels of politics and policy noise and risk, persistently higher levels of regulation and government intervention in the economy, and persistent and long lasting uh, changes in the fiscal in, 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 in the fiscal path and therefore also in credit rating, uh, credit sovereign, sovereign, sovereign credit ratings. Um, and therefore, uh, the, I, I, I think that in a way summarizes in terms of a framework of, of the, the before the before and after. Uh, unfortunately, I'd say that uh, Chile is becoming more Latin American and let's let's Swiss uh, in a way if you if you wanted to 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 put it simply. Thank you. To maximize time, I will take two questions together. One from Juan Caballeros. Excellent presentation. Thank you. What are your expectations for Central America, specifically Guatemala? And then Teresa Moll de Alba. How do you see the recovery or not process for small countries of the Caribbean? So Central America, Guatemala, Caribbean. Look, the, the challenge with, with Central America is that from the perspective of, of where we sit, um, we're primarily asset allocators, right? <clears throat> and so we try to analyze economies and markets uh, from mostly our DNA is top down, right? Uh, macroeconomic trends, um, political trends, and come up with investment implications in equities, bonds, and currencies. Central America and the Caribbean, Guatemala included, has relatively small asset markets. And therefore, to be quite honest, I, I, I don't follow it as closely. And I think I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll do a disfavor in, in terms of uh, providing an in-depth answer. Um, I, I will owe you that one. Sorry, Tatiana. No problem. We have another from George Cobell. What in your position will be the mayor major tech startups branches, as you mentioned, that have a micro effect? And why is it more like only to say as micro effects? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question fully, but I'd say um, uh, there is a lot of dynamism in uh, Latin American capitals in the tech space. This is not new. This has been happening for uh, the better part of the last decade. And right now we're seeing the fruits in a way of this effort. We are seeing uh, this uh, success stories, I think once again, in what I think is the intersection between tech and traditional industries. Uh, what I observe is that uh, tech and finance, fintech, is one of the areas in which there has been the most disruption and there will likely continue to be a lot of disruption because the penetration of, let's say, standard financial services in Latin America is extremely low. And technology can help uh, very quickly change this. Um, and uh, it's doing so. And we've seen you know, a number of companies, IPOs in major Latin American economies taking advantage of this. Uh, but this is not the only space where we see change. Uh, you know, technology, technology and, and food. Uh, there is one Chilean, startup that I'm sure some of you have followed or are following that uh, has disrupted the uh, plant-based food um, ecosystem starting in Latin America, but now it's branching out globally through a joint venture announced this week with uh, half, uh, um, uh, Kraft Heinz, right? 
uh, you know, very, very big deal, um, et cetera, et cetera. But my point is this can benefit uh, a subset of the economy. This can benefit a subset of people, but I don't see this having the potential to lift structural GDP growth in these countries on a sustainable basis, right? Because uh, the work that needs to be done, that the work that needs to be done on the human capital overall for a country, right? In terms of education, in terms of healthcare, uh, in terms of informality, the work that has to be done in, in physical infrastructure investment, right? Roads, bridges, schools, hospital uh, is, is gigantic, right? And, and has become bigger as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and so I wanna be mindful that I see this trend as a positive. However, is this going to change the trend of subpar economic activity in, in Latin America? I, I doubt it. I will move over to the chat. Um, we have a couple of questions there from Gladys Farge. What can be expected in LA as in Latin America as impact from USA internal external political behavior? From the, the United States political behavior? Is that the question? Yes. Um, look. Um, it's interesting, L Latin America was not the priority of the Trump administration uh, during the four years of his term, he visited the region only once, uh, which compares poorly with uh, what prior US presidents had, had done. Um, Latin America was supposed to be a bit more of the focus of the Biden administration, However, as a result of known facts, including what we're going through today, the energy, the attention has been shifted elsewhere. Um, and therefore, to be quite frank, I do not expect much in terms of, uh, you know, US involvement in Latin America changing meaningfully in coming months or as a result of the midterm elections that are coming up in the US uh, in, 20, in 2022. Of course, the one area where uh, I, where this might be different, different has to do with um, Latin America standing in the middle of the global power struggle between the US and China. And uh, to be, the, the way I, I'd frame it is, China will likely continue to try to get involved in, in the region and the US will most likely try to react and counteract, right? And so many countries in Latin America will have to walk that fine line and you know, trying to, to maintain open lines of communication with both countries, uh, ideally, rather than, than, than picking, picking sides. But it's not clear they will be able to do that in every, in every area. Uh, I, I hope I, I picked up uh, your your question and, and gave you some some color some color on this. Then we have a question from Harold Karam. With Peru, Chile, and probably Colombia turning to left, what will you expect with economic growth and exchange rate? Um, look, I think uh, the policy proposals that the incoming Castillo, Boric, uh, and Petro potentially administration have put on the table uh, are undoubtedly, I think, uh, structural growth negative. That would be my, my assessment. Now, uh, what we are seeing, however, is a big gap between uh, the candidates and the reality right, of once in office. Uh, Boric, as I highlighted briefly, has been moderating, has been surrounding himself by folks that uh, are relatively well-respected in key roles. Uh, 
uh, Castillo has been sheerly unable to govern and implement many of the things that he said he wanted to do. Uh, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with Petro if he wins and what kind of checks and balances the Congress will be able to impose on an incoming administration uh, after the elections on the 13th of this month. Uh, so I think by and large, the shine will come off uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this region, the Pacific Alliance, which have been over the last 20 years, the uh, better performing countries in terms of you know, growth, management of inflation, lifting people out of poverty. Uh, uh, I think that will moderate uh, in, in coming years. The view on exchange rates, it's a bit more complicated because as we see from performance of exchange rates year to date, uh, these are indicators that are very quick to price in the expectation of uh, subpar policies and politics. And they had been already pricing in quite a bit of bad news um, and then when you see some moderation, you see some relief rally, and in a context of very high commodity prices, that's also something to, to consider. So uh, we're not necessarily negative on, on exchange rates from current uh, uh, valuations. When you look at, for instance, the, uh, how the, the Colombian peso is standing relative to, to history in real terms, it's a currency that is trading very, very cheap. A lot of bad news is priced thin, so that's something to to take into account. Okay, then we have one from Ambassador Alfredo Raggio. Can you comment further on Latin American debt taking into account the hikes in interest rates? Which are the countries in a more complicated situation? Absolutely. Um, look, when when looking at debt sustainability, it is important to look at overall debt ratios, debt to GDP, that's the starting point. But the analysis shouldn't end just there. Uh, you need to incorporate uh, and look into how much of that debt is in local currency versus foreign currency, how much of that debt is short-term, medium-term, long-term, uh, how much of that debt is held by uh, locals, how much is held by sovereigns, right? And so a given debt to GDP, but with debt that is primarily external, held by foreigners and short term, is a much more dangerous debt to GDP that uh, is, for instance, primarily domestic, uh, long term, and held by uh, locals, if that makes sense, right? And so it's important to to look under under the hood. Uh, I do not think that major Latin American economies. I'm talking about Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, uh, will have issues of debt sustainability in the near term. I think debt ratios will worsen, but it is not an immediate source of concern. Uh, Argentina's debt sustainability situation is very challenging. Uh, the country has no access to international capital markets. I do not think it will have access as a result of the IMF, uh, uh, the IMF agreement that's ongoing. Uh, uh, let, you know, the, 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 the core of the problem has not been addressed and will remain with us for the foreseeable future. And Brazil is the big question mark, right? Because the front runner of the elections, uh, Lula, is proposing changes in the way uh, the fiscal rule is going to be managed uh, and spending overall. It's very unclear exactly what he means by that. We went, we've got an eternity separating us from the October elections. But um, what I'd say is that things look calm right now in terms of Brazil, debt dynamic and debt sustainability, but this is going to be a recurrent source of stress for the markets uh, in coming quarters, right? And so I'd put, I'd put 
uh, Brazil not in the uh, default uh, bucket because Brazil has very low levels of external debt uh, and it's primarily domestic debt. Uh, so they can in a way print their way out, but uh, as a source of market stress, potential spillovers on the currency uh, down the road, et cetera. I have a few more questions here. We may not be uh, able to take all of them, but I want to take this one from Philippe Nell, our honorary ambassador here at the chamber. Thank you very much for the, your presentation. China's demand has played a strong role in Latin America's growth over the past decade on the commodity side. Is that sustainable for the next decade? Or if not, what should Latin America do to move forward and increase its presence on international markets? Absolutely. Um, look, I think commodity demand from China will remain uh, relatively important. Uh, of course, the importance of China in this realm will likely decline as uh, the growth engine of the country uh, shifts um, from investment to a bit more consumption, from a focus on uh, the external side of the equation to focus on the domestic side of the equation. I'm talking about China. Uh, however, uh, even if this is the case, our analysis of the outlook for commodity markets market seems it's relatively good, right? Uh, in terms of we have seen uh, little, in, I'm talking in very generic terms, the challenge with commodities, we would have to go line by line, right? Energy, agriculture, base metals, precious metals. But if we talk about in generic ways, uh, there's been little investment in commodities over the last 10 years. So the supply side of the equation is quite challenged, uh, particularly when you look at energy, we're experiencing this in recent days, when you look at base metals such as copper. And therefore, uh, in an environment in which we're seeing an increase in demand, as we come out of the global pandemic, we reopen on a more sustainable basis. And uh, uh, also the, the green uh, revolution is feeding demand for a number of, 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 of commodities in order to you know, make, make this happen, right? So my whole point is that we are relatively bullish commodity prices, even if China takes a little bit of it off the back seat. And this constructive outlook is focused on energy, focused on um, base metals such as copper, uh, uh, a bit more mixed in the area of agriculture. Uh, and from current levels, uh, precious metals is something that you know we see has run maybe a little bit too far too fast and is due for, for some uh, adjustment downwards, if that makes sense. Okay, um, I will take two more questions from the ones that are already here. Um, let's see. What should we expect about Chinese investment agenda in Latin American countries? For example, Argentina in nuclear energy. Um, China will continue to be an active player in the region, uh, not as... Uh, indiscriminate, let's call it, as it's been during some years of the last decade, uh, maybe more targeted according to its adapting priorities. But I think we should continue to see strategic investments by, by China or attempts by strategic investments by China in, in, in the region. Um, uh, and we continue to see this in, in, in a number of countries. And the last one from Angelo Colombo. Uh, since there is a growing left-wing likelihood in Latin America, would you anticipate a stronger political union within the region in the upcoming years? Um, no, I'm not sure, to be, to be honest. Um, these are a very heterogeneous bunch of leftist leaders and um, it, I don't think it's I don't think it's it's evident or a given 
that we will see uh, a coalition that works properly and that works uh, that has any impact on uh, you know the strategic direction of of Latin America. Uh, therefore, um, to be to be quite frank, I, I'm not I'm not sure, uh, but that you know in a way that should help answer the question. I, I don't see it as, as, as an immediate an immediate reality. Uh, let's not forget that uh, Argentina has elections in, in 2023 that you know can really help influence the agenda at least of the southern cone uh, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen there. Okay, if um, you agree, uh, I think we can close here. We have reached the end of this webinar. And uh, all of our audience, you will certainly agree with me that our speaker gave us an outstanding overview and outlook for what lies ahead, bearing in mind um, the new, very serious scenario of war and sanctions underlying. Thank you so much, Alejo Servonko, for providing us with a very comprehensive picture of the current situation but also opportunities in the Latin American markets. It was truly enlightening to listen to you as usual. Thank you also, Matthias Musch, for your introductory message and for making sure that LATCAM receives the support from UBS as our patron member. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us in uh, such a high number. Uh, I hope you profited from today's presentation and discussion. If you feel there's a pressing question still burning on your lips and you have not been able to um, ask it, please send it to me uh, to latcom at latcom.ch and I will pass it on to Alejo, I promise. I look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar, which will be publicized very shortly. Till then, be safe and goodbye.